We're going to haunt you right through Halloween. We're not a guy and his yes man. Some say these two trainers were quietly in the shadows. Robert Weatherwax, last of the legendary Lassie trainers from the world's greatest movie dog training family, was quietly hidden in his TV work. And Christoph Klugston elite action K9 trainer was traveling from the sub-zero arctic to the sweltering jungle heat training dogs on three continents. But a chance meeting changed all of that. Now, Robert and Christoph have joined forces and they're breaking the silence. For the first time, the secretive and hidden world of the movie dog trainer and the science of the elite tactical trainer will be revealed. That's right, they are out of the shadows. Welcome to Tactical Practical. This episode, we're going to be talking about what to do if your dog bolts or takes off. And that covers a couple things because when we talk about bolting or taking off, we're talking about if the dog's on a leash, you get him to be walking the dog and he takes off. But also we're going to be talking about what if the dog bolts out of the house. Pretty common. People open the door. That's how people lose dogs often. Same thing with the car door. The dog's in the back of the car or maybe in the front seat next to you, passenger seat. Open the door or you open your door and he zings out and takes off so we're going to be covering those things there's quite a bit to say about this and we're going to present a few things but we're not be the be all end all in this because once again our whole point here is to raise awareness and to clue you into things you might not know and solve some problems but as usual everything that you might want to know we can talk to you in a, con a phone consult or maybe a skype consult or a zoom consult don't give up on those resources people because this is not the only thing that we do anyway robert we're works with a lot of pet dog owners and one of the concerns that they're going to have obviously and the thing that I get from people when they want me to train their pet dogs is of course this we call it barriers or thresholds basically wherever there's a door <laughs> that they get out of or sometimes windows it's another story but they all try to get out of they'll try to get out of these and there are a lot of reasons for that but Robert's gonna take us on the first part of this and then I'll come back in and add more things and that's how we do it you know anyway Robert uh, so let's Let's start at the beginning. Okay, well, if we're in a situation where the dog has already escaped, he's already... I actually have a story to tell you to, to bridge into that. I once went to a client's house, and uh, they opened the door, but they opened it kind of like crack, like they were afraid the dog was going to run out. And I tried to talk to him, and they opened the door a little bit more, and the dog ran out. He ran past me. This was on my first appointment, right? He ran past me, and he went across the street, and he started fighting with the dog through the fence across the street. And I, I clapped my hands really loud, and then I dropped like I had a heart attack on the lawn and the dog came back to me so what I'm saying is that you have to find a way first of all to catch your dog that's that's job number one catch your dog and then uh, after you've caught your dog you can't be angry about it because yeah. why would they want to come back next time right yeah. I mean oh yeah last time I ran away and then I went back to him and he smacked me on the nose or whatever he did and that's not going to be an enticement for them to come back especially that first time so what I do is I take him back to the scene of the crime on a long leash with a training collar and I put him back in that place where they originally committed the crime whether that's a doorway, uh, the door uh, when you opened it from the car, whatever it may be, you know, uh, jumping off a curb, just anything. Because, you know, dogs tend to anticipate things. So uh, my dad always said for when it comes to reward, you reward them twice for stay for every time you call them. Because they want to come. They want to run. Um, but they don't really want to stay. At least at least the dogs I refer to in my book as go dogs, right? Um, they don't want to stay. And most of those sporting dogs and the terriers, they're go dogs. They just are, uh, almost always. That's really much where I'd start. I just put them back on a stay where they originally broke the stay and I would start setting up distractions around the out the perimeter of the house mm -hmm. um, so that the dog is enticed to break that stay um, but always in a position where I can correct the dog but I'm not going to keep the dog from going out but once he takes that first step and he's over the threshold that's when I have to bring him back and when once I bring him back I'm not going to reward him because he violated the rule uh, then I'll give him an opportunity to get a reward which I'll make a maybe a 10 15 second if he can hold it that long and reward them to reinforce that moment and then start stretching the time uh, 30 seconds 45 seconds a minute you know start rewarding less and less because i don't want the dogs to rely on reward i don't get dogs to do things for rewards i get them to do it after they perform the act i don't use it as an enticement to perform the act um so there's a big difference you know when you're talking about using food you know food is just a conditioning technique uh you know the first time i became a trainer my dad stuck pavlov's dog in my hand and he said read that and i did and I, I understood that there's a certain amount of conditioning
conditioning that has to go on in, in training. And that's why repetition is really what it's all about. Do it over and over. Just like they do a thing in Hollywood. It's like they always say, oh, that shot was perfect. Now let's do it one more time. It's like yeah. it's never it's never good enough. It can always be better. And doing it one more time is, is always going to make it better. Maybe not immediately. But at one point, you'll see it all the time where the dog seems like they're not really getting it. And all of a sudden, bam, it just clicks. You got to just do it until it clicks. Let's go backwards here on this bit. There's, uh, We're not following a chronological order exactly on everything we we're gonna shotgun approach this topic but let's go back if you that happened on the first instance that you met this dog that of course was the solution for that that time but hopefully you're able to get the clients to start doing something before that happens and by that i mean it's pretty common the roberts also agrees with this that the dog has a collar and if you're talking about puppy you have to go through the conditioning of the collar so the dog doesn't or the puppy doesn't think it's a big deal has to get used to it habituates to it uh, accommodates to it and then right. you then you'll have the dog drag around a leash and this of course is why this leash in the house shouldn't really have any knots or anything on it because it'll be catching everything but you want to get the dog used to having a leash and there are certain bird dog trainers that do this this is one of the one of the big things that they do so that the dog is used to a leash and then also because they train with long lines also and this gets them used to it and so that you can use this they get the dog used to having the leash and now when you start going to the door at, we're talking about the house door right now start using the house door then you're going to switch to your your longer leash with the knot at the end so that you can step on it and, and stop the dog if you're too slow to catch the leash and uh, I have my jungle dog coming up into the frame right now anyway the so this is this happens and one of the things that uh, I think that we agree on is that you want to have the dog uh, used to wearing the same collars that you're going to be training in so this is a, a breaking in period you can call it that now I will say what to do here this is another way to train the dog so it's not going to go outside threshold of the doorway I'm already counting on that you have a release word signal it's really a signal release signal people like to use okay or free you can use those everybody uses those they're not mine but you're going to have that so that the dog knows the dog can wander off or go forward after you give this <laughs> release signal and you're going to use the front door and you're going to have the door close and you're going to go up to the door and have the dog now this is where our marks or touch pads or uh, whatever you want to call it are in used you put and you have that down on the on the ground so the dog hopefully you've already trained this aspect and look to our other podcasts where we talk about that mark training so the dog is used to the mark and you're going to reward the dog for being on the mark and now you're going to slowly open the door and you're going to reward the dog for staying on or reinforce the dog for staying on the mark you're going to keep doing this keep doing this opening the door and then finally getting the door all the way open and then you're going to do what robert said you're going to build up duration you're going to build up time but you're going to constantly reward the dog for being on the mark then you're going to allow the dog to go outside you can go i don't care if you go with the dog or you let the dog go first or you go first a lot of people have some sort of problem with that but i do not and as you know from movies you, you got to have the dog capable of doing it with a person or without a person so you better to train the dog be able to do this on his own go out you're going to have the release word and have the dog go out go across the threshold go outside the door and then you're going to get the dog back in and reward reinforce on that location see once again everything's about location because what we want to do is we want that location to be a reward history a background of being reinforced right there on that pad and not outside so whenever the dog is outside you're that's self-reinforcement the dog is okay going out there and then you want the reinforce coming back so this starts building a history that the dog knows that coming back in or not going out is what you want to do uh, uh, what do you think about that robert do you agree with that that pr approach do you have you used yeah no no yeah definitely yeah definitely and and something i just thought of that you always kind of jog thoughts into my <laughs> mind when you bring up something yeah. As I thought about um, the way that I reinforce, you know, when I'm at a door, let's just use the, the door at the house because that's the most common scenario I run into. I mean, it could be the front yard, it could be the garage, it doesn't really matter. Right. But you establish a line. So the dog yeah. knows he can go side to side, right? Yeah. He can go side yeah. to side. Yeah. He's not sitting. He doesn't right. have to sit, right? right. Um, he just has to stay.
stay there. Yeah. And I think it's more impressive to have a dog who can stand and stay yeah. when they're already in a position to run, right? And then I, I work it from behind in the beginning so that I use that 50-foot leash. If I have enough room to use it all, I'll go straight back behind the dog and I'll, I'll go a little like five feet, then 10 feet, yeah. and I'll reinforce the correction from there. Once I've established that, I'll leave the leash down on the ground and I'll go around the front of the dog, out where he wants to go, right? Uh, and then I'll start, you know, using hand signals, walking around, going further away from the dog. If he runs away, he's going to go by me with that long leash, so I'm going to be able to grab it. You still have the leash on. You still have your parachute, but now yeah. you're really jumping out of the plane. You're jumping right out of the plane. If you're in front of the, the dog, um, they're going to want to be with you, but you're just... I only use hand signals. I always tell my clients, you know, the only time you should be talking to your dog when you have them on a stay is when you go in to reward them and when you leave them. Yeah. There's no other time. Um, I might use a hand signal when I'm walking across the street or something, yeah. but I don't see stay 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 over and over again because yeah. i feel like if i have to say it 10 times what's the point of training him at all yeah i try to keep it simple um too many words when you're doing stay uh, can be huge and another thing too is use a food reward not because i believe in food rewards but because if you touch the dog when he's on a stay some dogs are very reactive about human touch yeah. especially from their owners so if you're working your dog if i'm telling the owner hey i want you to now do what i'm doing um i don't want them touching the dog because if they touch him it's almost like a release, an emotional release. Um, and I'd, mm -hmm. I'd rather that not happen. That's why I use food. In my book, I call that the neutral reward. And that's exactly what it is. It's a neutral reward that doesn't have any emotional connotation attached. Well, that's a primary reinforcer uh, for us and for, well, every organism. Every organism it needs to eat. So this is why it's called a primary reinforcer because there's thing we all do something <laughs> to eat and right. that's a pretty in-depth uh, discussion of, of that uh, and now uh, the same thing can be done with the car except that you can also practice this if you have a garage inside the garage because you can open both sides uh, you're going to start out with only one you should also by the way really use one door of the car let's say you have a four-door car and you maybe you have a hatchback too you should only use one of these as the entrance and exit for your dog it doesn't matter and always like it's just like when they tell when if you learn how to ride horses always get up on the left side only mount the horse on the left side because they'll get used to it and they won't get freaked out about it and the same thing if you constantly use this one eliminates confusion for the dog two it's it's fast <laughs> because with eliminating options it's much faster to train one of the things that you'll find all the TV movie dog trainers always saying we lead the dog onto the set in one way and take him out the same way. We will never try to go three or four or five different ways. It creates confusion for the dog, makes the handling or directing the dog much more difficult. Same thing with the car. So stick with one, one door, one, and that door might be obviously, maybe the passenger side if you don't have anybody else that ever rides up there, or you have to tell people get in the back. <laughs> That's kind of fun. I like to do that, especially <laughs> with my protection dog because they won't argue with that stuff, you know? So anyway, but most of the time it's in the back seat, right? You do that, and again, it's the same process. You, be, you create that that car is a safe zone. Number one, inside the car is a safe zone, and that becomes a location for reinforcement. Enforcement. I cannot, I'm giving out secrets here. The big secrets to what we do as a tactical or movie TV trainer is that we're about location. And this is how we use location for us. And also, Robert brought up something before. And I just want to say it again because it's more impressive to have a dog standing at the door, not sitting at the door. Most people want the dog to do a sit. But if you can have the dog remaining in the stand and not going out, but acting normal, well, for movies, you need this, number one. But it's just a, it shows more finesse, better control, better dog training ability. So that's why we kind of, we kind of want to. Do well, the dog that. looks, the dog looks alive, you know? It's like, hey, yeah. that dog's alive, you know? He's not, <laughs> yeah. he's not a statue. He's really alive. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, some of you may have a problem with your dogs being. Uh, is that dog dead? Uh, <laughs> you you yeah. might have that. You it's something we that. bought at the pottery store. We yeah. bought them at the pottery store. Modern yeah. art, right? Modern art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, some dogs are pretty slothful. I mean, we. Uh, but a lot of the, the high tempo, the high tempo dogs are not. You won't mistake them for modern art. But let me let me now go to another aspect of this, and that's to protect your dog if the dog does 
break away, get away from you. And I'm talking especially in an unknown area. Say you're out, you're a park or you went somewhere and you stopped and you're on a long drive. You stopped and the dog somehow just got away, got away. And there's many ways that that can happen. We want to preempt problems. One, by having a collar that has the information, identification information for you. Contact. Doesn't have to have anything about the dog. You don't need to put the dog's name on there. In fact, I'd rather not put the dog's name on there for a bunch of reasons that I don't need to go into right now. You can set up a consult if you want to know why tactically I would not put the dog's name on there. It has your contact information and also I have on my uh, collars that says microchipped. So it lets people know that they can have the dog scanned and that information will come up to how to reach me besides the phone number that I have and I put a cell phone number on there. I don't put a landline. I put a cell phone number on the collar and I don't put it on a tag. One of the things, it's very easy for tags to get ripped off. Uh, a lot of people think, yeah, it's easier to put a tag on than plate, but it's not really. The And they come off, Robert has talked about in the past about how even the leash can rip the tags off. Like the dog gets, dog gets wrapped around and doing things uh, you're going through the brush, the the, the the twigs can rip the, the tags that hang down off. Also, the leashes can get on them and rip them off. So you're much safer by putting a plate across the back of the collar. And another thing, of course, is to microchip the dog. This is not expensive. This is something that everybody should be doing well, i don't know why nowadays people are not doing that every single one of my dogs has a microchip and if you fly internationally with your dogs which i have flown with some of my dogs you have to have this microchip so it protects you completely nobody can argue with you nobody can say well that was my dog or this that the other thing you can't because i have the microchip i have the record of it and the information they can't change it that's in a st storage place there's a lot of places that more than just one directory for these uh, microchips, by the way. And one other thing you can do is if you live in certain areas, the GPS tracker things that you can put on the actual collar are pretty good, especially if you live in an area with a lot of cell phone towers because that's how they operate and they do a triangulation of where the dog is at and you can find the dog in real time, which is great. You know, a lot of them, however, on a subscription fee, because you know, that's not whatever. A lot of them is. have uh, lights on the on them too. They have like light activated stuff and yeah there's yeah. a lot of really look into it but there's a lot of high-tech gps callers out there yeah um and one and one thing i wanted to mention that uh we had uh probably mentioned you and i off off camera um about uh you know the placement of the training collar in relation to right. the yeah. regular yeah. id collar with the tag we always want to have it behind the, tr the training collar will be behind the id collar so that when the dog runs away from you and you correct them not going to pull the other collar off or rip the tag right. off it's just going to stop the dog at the chest not up here at the trachea well it's not it's not just that, that I, I, you know, safety is important yeah but not it's not just that aspect with that collar it's also the fact that if it's in front it can get bound up on on the other collar and it's not going to be effective right. yeah it's not going to be it's not going to be effective either too because it's uh it's suddenly you got a you got a speed bump <laughs> it's too, so it's more know. humane and it's more humane and it's more it's more uh effective right. so so that's practical and tactical you say yeah. kind of yeah, the same I, thing yeah that's mm -hmm. what that, that's what we're all about here as you'll notice people yeah. that we're going down this thing some of the reasons that we're going to cover this uh this is really a great guide that we're putting out for especially first time novice dog owners because you got to know why a dog would run away number number one reason is because they see something that's <laughs> exciting and it's more exciting than what they were doing before and with many dogs of course that's going to be uh, especially with the sight hounds with saluki's uh, uh, Afghan hounds, greyhounds. That's 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 kind of why you want to start behind them when you're enforcing yeah. it, because then you can see what the dog's seeing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but they're also, I mean, if they see a squirrel, a rabbit, bazing, they're going. So you gotta, you have to know that the area that you're going to be in, you got to know your front yard. If you have a front yard, hopefully you do, or a backyard, whatever. You got to know, is it is it rabbit zone? <laughs> is it is it a squirrel zone? And this is, of course, you'll upgrade your training to those distractions, but you won't start out with them. 
them around. You got to know that that that's one of the things. Also, dogs on their territory. When the dogs and most dogs are going to be territorial, just like you are. If somebody tries to come into your property and you don't know who they are, you're probably going to react to that. And dogs are the same way. I don't know why people think that canines are going to be less reactful than he, primate humans. I don't understand that. But anyway, so this is they're going to react to that quite a bit. And uh, another thing is if you're not exercising the dog, uh, Robert's talked about taking the dog on walks in other podcasts. And if you're not taking the dog on walks and if you're not exercising the dog and the dog is inside, especially if you have an apartment or, or a condominium and, and the dog is cooped up more hours than he's not, he's going to want to get out or she's going to want to get out and take off because they want to do something. Unless you've got one of those sloth dogs, like the old English bulldog. That's pretty much a sloth dog. And they're going to want to go and do things. And that's that's incentive. That's a reason. And you can't penalize them for wanting to get exercise. This is something you, that's what is important here. you got to know the difference. Like, what is the motivation yeah. for the dog? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. A good, a, good po- a good point, too, is that, you know, create situations where, you know, distractions. Um, you don't want to shy away from them. You don't want to, uh, yeah. at nighttime, uh, the dogs don't, you know, there's a lot of rabbits out. Sometimes yeah. I'll take the dog outside, let him check out the area around them. I mean, if you're not going to walk them, at least let them see what's out there. Um, and yeah. that way you can, uh, you know, the dog will, will well, well, it ties into what you were saying, where the dog, it's not a mystery as to what's out there because you took them out there. Um, it's even better to do the training after having walked them. I always like to do the stay uh, after yeah, yeah. a walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, unless you want an extra hard challenge. But in right. the beginning, I want to wear the dog out a little bit before I yeah. do stay. And vice versa, I want, you know, I want to have the dog come when maybe they don't have quite as much energy, you know, yeah, yeah. and see how reliable it really is. Well, all this ties into our whole greater way that we train train so it's so when we break things down and we focus on one part of the dog training sometimes we feel like oh we're not thorough enough <laughs> but we are and the problem is we don't want to do deep dives and everything because then we end up in our whole the whole way we do things but what robert's talking about leads into recall training it leads into letting the dog run exhaust himself that's very important have exercise for dogs is incredibly important but this is just part of this threshold training this r- remaining at the at the mark this is very important but it should be done after the dog has already let out some energy this is one of the things we got to say and that will also win a little vibey here on you that uh, this will change the whole entire vibe with the dog too by the way and this will make the dog more receptive to learning right Robert I mean then you run into that don't you all the time yeah absolutely training. absolutely you know, I look I talk about uh, commands you know in a static uh, or an active mode and to me uh, you know static means that you're wanting more control um, but when you're talking active you're you're letting the dog kind of unleash his own energy. You're not putting uh, clamps on them so that they can't do things. You're letting them, you know, I tell people, when your dog comes to you, give them big praise. You know, big, love, great praise. But when they're doing stay, don't really talk to them at all. Keep a monotone voice. Don't be doing things that actually create uh, them breaking their stay. Um, you know, you don't want to, you know, tiptoe around like and not make any noise. But by the same token, you don't want to do things that actually induce them doing exactly what you don't want. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Then this is, uh, people, this has been really precise information on this, on the barriers. If you if you feel like you still want more information, then uh, make sure to contact us because that's what we're all about. You know, we're here to, once again, raise awareness about this stuff, let out some break the silence, let out things that other people don't talk about that they don't, they don't know. Robert and I together combined have a hundred years of experience and this is just facts no one else does has that not on the platforms that we're on nobody else has that and we're not uh this is one thing i just want to say about this our podcast video cast that makes us separate from all the other video casts that i see out there we're not a guy and his yes man <laughs> which is what or his right. yes or his yes entourage which you will find on, on most dog channels or any podcast there's one person that's the authority and then the other people oh yes oh you're so great oh wonderful yeah oh tell me more uh that's not what we're about we're we're both experts and we're contributing and giving you this so it's uh and i and i don't agree with and i don't agree with everything you say uh, but i agree with most of what you say that's why i'm here yeah. um because you know we might be off a little bit on certain things but we're pretty much playing on the same lane at the bowling alley um yeah. so you know i might do a gutter ball once in a while he might do a gutter ball but we're on the same lane we're yeah. we're connecting but there are certain things that because of our background that make us a little bit different yep. uh but they're subtle differences they're not uh, big gaps 
you know. Yeah, yeah. Not you know, not everybody can fly the big jets. That's all I got to say <laughs> you know, over here uh, on this uh, <laughs> on this one. The uh, anyway, so uh, that's our episode. And if you found it interesting, remember, people, you get it. You need to uh, you know like, uh, share, subscribe, and we'll be back again. I haven't said that. We haven't said that in a while, but that's what it's all about. Anyway, yeah, we'll be back. We'll be. But you want us or not, we'll be back. Right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. We're coming back, damn it, because we're here to set the okay. record straight. It's not about getting friends. It's about setting the record straight here. We're gonna that's haunt you right through Halloween. You know? Yeah, wait to our special Halloween <laughs> episode, by the way. We have a special yeah. Halloween episode coming up. Sorry. Right, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe we'll tell a story or two about Spook. I can tell yeah. a story about Spook, which was uh, Lassie number number three. Um, yeah. You know, we could tell some yeah. Spook stories. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah.